Australian journalists are still not allowed in. How short-sighted, in your view, is this, given our relationship is starting to improve? Well, very short-sighted, I would argue, with a degree of self-interest, uh, you know, as a, as a correspondent who has, who has been lucky to travel to China a couple of times, but I've not been allowed there in on a, a long-term visa. Uh, you know, it's an unbelievably diverse, optimistic, quirky country full of wonderful people and wonderful stories. Uh, and unfortunately, the Chinese government doesn't see it that way, or at least doesn't believe that Australian media um, at the moment is capable of telling those stories. I think the media probably has largely um, been somewhat of a victim of the broader um, bilateral tensions between Australia and China. And what happened is that basically Australian correspondents who were assigned to cover China haven't been allowed uh, to go back in. What's happened in that process is that, well, if we can't get into China, I've pretty much covered circumnavigated its border in trying to find stories as close as I can. So whether it's Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, Mongolia, uh, the border with China uh, and Tibet and India, uh, you know, we went right around China's territory to find what stories we could. Uh, and they're not always positive stories. But one thing I will say is that the closer you get to China, the less the fear of China is. You know, the great, the great scare campaigns around China are often the loudest the further you are away from it. And I think that's an important message. Uh, that interaction is not something to be scared of, that uh, if China does welcome foreign journalists again, it could have really proud stories to tell. But it also has to accept that some journalism will be critical. Uh, and a proud country uh, should not be afraid to hide both its missteps uh, and some of its glories. Yeah, and that's, I think that's a tension that it's trying to come to terms with. When you travel to Tibet, when you travel to Mongolia, I mean, one of the criticisms of Xi Jinping is not only his authoritarianism, but he's, tr he's sort of trying to nullify that diversity. It is, and, and certainly in, in Mongolia, when I spoke to Mongolian language teachers who had fled from China's northernmost province, you know, they were scared not just for their families, but for themselves. Um, one of them told me he was worried he'd be murdered tomorrow just for trying to preserve his language, the Mongolian language in China. Uh, and so th there's ethnic minorities who are feeling like they are under attack in China. But if Xi Jinping's message is that the cost of having those independent minorities diminished is greater economic growth, well, then that's a story that, that China should tell Unfortunately, at the moment, it's only allowing people to view it from the outside in. And I think that is contributing overall to a more negative view of China than would otherwise be the case. Yeah. So when you, when you say, you, you know, you, you, you try to get those stories out, the stories closer to the kernel of China. I mean, when I visited years ago, you, you felt this really burgeoning cultural um, movement. You felt just a, a wonderful sense of freedom and development. Do you think that's still flourishing or has it been contained? No, it's certainly been contained within mainland China. Uh, lawyers, human rights, um, activists, anyone who is associated with ideas like freedom of the press, freedom of religion, those voices have certainly um, been undermined. Uh, even now, talking to economists in China, uh, just on analysts, uh, forecasts of market predictions are scared of talking publicly. It's gotten to the point where anyone quoted in the foreign media uh, is potentially a target for the Ministry of State Security. And what that results in is just a, a, both a public that is that is scared to, to tell the truth, but also a government that is scared to face facts. Mm -hmm. And at a time where China is going through, you know, a pretty significant economic downturn, I think both the combination of those factors only makes a, a bad problem worse. How do you think China is going to grapple with this shift in its economy? Because, of course, it's just had years and years of just extraordinary growth. There's some fundamental problems there, which, again, do you think they are looking at squarely in the eye? Or do they even have the skill set to sort of adjust to all of, all of that? Well, certainly, um, reducing the, the level of economic critique is not going to allow them to meet some of these challenges head on. 
uh, at the moment, it is doing some restructuring. It is looking at, at, at social reforms, but it's tinkering around the edges. We're still seeing a government that is focused on supply side, on you know whether it's heavy um, in, in infrastructure or property development, these boom sides of its economy that served it really well when people thought that tomorrow their investment was going to go up. But unfortunately, what we're seeing now is that people in China are seeing those investments go down. And what's happening is that people are borrowing away their savings because there's no sense in investing if tomorrow your property, for example, is going to be worth less than it was today. Yeah. You know, we've we've watched a strange, well, of course, you've been the correspondent, as we've had this shift in relations, this complete deep freeze, we're now coming out of that and things are normalising. To your point earlier, do you think China is starting to understand that you can't dictate another nation's values as they were trying to, to Australia? Look, I think Australia is a really interesting case study. It, it, really, we're this kind of uppity nation, 25 million people for a long time there. China looked at what Australia was doing on Huawei foreign interference legislation, certainly the COVID-19 inquiry, and said, you know, what, what the hell does Australia think it's doing? How dare it speak to a big nation like us of 1.4 billion people? Um, I think... Perhaps the way that Australia looked to gain the support of places like the United States and across Europe, and now even the United Kingdom, which for a long time there was a much bigger supporter of China, um, has changed that dynamic. And it's seen that some of that economic coercion of a smaller country like Australia has not been anywhere near as successful as it thought it might be. And now, you know, when I first started reporting on the trade strikes back in uh, 2020, um, you know, twenty billion dollars all of a sudden was coming down the pay pipeline in, in in trade hits. Almost all of those are now gone. Mm. And at what cost to Australia, apart from maybe reopening dialogue with China, and most importantly, the ongoing detention of Yang Heng Jun? I think it's fair to say that the actual economic coercion campaign failed. And you know, we've seen this time and time again. It happened with Japan. It happened with Korea. The tactics don't work because democratic governments uh, tend to be able to resist them in a way that other states may have capitulated sooner. Yeah. Well, Eric, really good to get your reflections. Uh, congratulations on your time uh, covering these issues and uh, good luck with what uh, lies ahead. Thanks so much. Great to chat, Bev.